Yeah, so definitely switching gears a little bit here. Um, so here we're going to be talking much more about uh, measuring humans as opposed to some of these other things. So tricky for measurement for very different reasons. Um, and just to kind of stress some of the importance of this, I wanted to talk about training kind of generally. We all know it's important, uh, and sometimes it kind of falls by the wayside, but especially as we're onboarding new people, we need to make sure they're getting up to speed and able to understand kind of what is the background and what are the additional things that they might learn over time as they're um, kind of working with and operating these this huge range of systems that we work with in DOD and NASA and the range of organizations that we have coming in here. Um, so here what we wanted was a kind of uh, training scale that would work across the full range of systems that we were looking at. Uh, a different kind of assessment would be something like knowledge skills assessment for some kind of specific system that you have to look at what the specific skills that are required for that uh, for using that system effectively. Here we really wanted something that could be useful for uh, test and evaluation, so something that could work for uh, developmental testing, operational testing, kind of everything in between here. Um, and just thinking about it in the kind of grand scheme of things, training is one of these early on um, things that feeds into other good aspects of system use that we would like to see. So you might start with training, but that's going to fit into how well you can upskill yourself. Uh, that might impact the level of usability. If I'm well trained, I know how to use these different functions and quickly get to what I want to use. And that might decrease the workload, which is especially important under some of these kind of high stress, fast paced situations that our operators are sometimes put into. Um, so in line with this too, we also want to be able to trace back to understand um, how this kind of, what the root cause of different issues that might be coming up are. Where are these issues actually manifesting? So it might be farther downstream in workload, but there are a range of different factors that kind of feed into this human system interaction process, uh, any of which might be impacting things down the line. Um, and this is one kind of notional one that we use for a lot of systems, but uh, depending on the system, depending on the way that uh, you work with it to uh, apply to the mission and the tasks that you're looking at, uh, things might change depending on what you're doing. So here, um, I'm kind of stripping back a lot of the um, detail in here. I'm happy to answer some of these questions, uh, but I really wanted to just give you a big overview of what we were uh, looking at and trying to do for this new scale that we were uh, developing and have been testing for a little while. Um, so the first thing was really looking at does this impact um, self-efficacy, so the ability of operators to feel like they can execute the job and get the mission done. Uh, the second uh, is was this uh, training, at least from their perspective, relevant to the task that they're trying to apply um, the system to. Um, I talked a little bit about the bottom point there, so I won't go into that. And here is kind of the big process that um, you can really dig into if you really want to know about the details of all of these steps. It is not a simple process to uh, make sure that the survey that you're trying to apply to people is reliable, is valid across the range of operators that you're interested in across the range of systems that you might want to apply it to. Um, so here we're kind of um, focusing in on one aspect of that and we're planning to kind of continue down the line trying to uh, fill in more of these gaps and make sure that it's uh, valid and representative for some of these things we want it to measure. So um, tying back to the specific things that we're interested in, uh, the two things that we wanted to look at here and that we thought were especially relevant for um, T&E, for DOD systems, first one is efficacy. Um, so what do, degree does training impact self-efficacy? Um, it's been shown in multiple contexts to uh, have useful outcomes. It predicts performance. Uh, it predicts learning rates of being able to adapt to different consequences or different circumstances. Um, just a range of different things, uh, and then the relevance, kind of like I talked about before. Um, so 
It's not very useful if I'm putting you through a training, might be hours long, might be days long, if I'm giving you information that doesn't actually impact what you're trying to do in the field. So I don't need to train you on all these capabilities that might actually be useful for you. So this started out with a 15-item uh, response uh, survey scale. So essentially what we did is we did an iterative process with some subject matter experts, uh, statisticians, human factors people, and came up with a set of items um, after we had figured out these two response scales are the ones that we wanted to look at. Um, they all should read pretty kind of intuitively to uh, many of you. Uh, we have the relevance subscale, looking at things like I can sell, see myself using what I learned during training, in training, during real operations, all the information covered was relevant. Um, and then the efficacy subscale, looking at things such as I'd be confident using the system, uh, or the reverse scored one, I'd want additional training before I actually use this thing in the field. So here we did try to include some of these reverse scored items. Uh, these tend to help for different reasons, uh, to make sure people are paying attention so that we can kind of get the full range of uh, variability in responses as long as people are responding to the same kind of construct of training efficacy that we're interested in. Okay, um, so structure validation is what we're doing right here. Um, so here, what we're really trying to look at um, in the most straightforward terms is do these two subscales that we think exist in training, uh, do they actually come out in the data? So once we actually apply this survey, can we measure these two distinctly and are they kind of statistically separable from one another in the responses that we could get with this scale? Um, and what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, compare this against a one-factor model saying maybe there aren't these two different types, maybe it's all just one uh, construct that I'm trying to measure that's how good was my training and it doesn't break down into those two separate uh, sub-factors that we kind of hypothesized. And those are the two things that we're going to compare here. Um, so we're going to check for uh, reliable and consistent response, responses both within and separation between those subscales. And the way that we kind of do this in reality, it's usually kind of an iterative response. We want to um, propose a model or a set of models. We want to compare it to relevant alternatives. Um, there's also different ones that we could do here. And then we're going to work with subject matter experts and um, users and people who are using these to refine the model and try to get it to a better spot uh, to make sure that it's working well across all of the um, systems and users of interest that we are that we care about for this. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into the notation here but essentially this is how I'm going to present a lot of things. Uh, these square boxes on the bottom are the uh, items that we're actually measuring. These circles up top are the latent constructs, we call them. It's essentially something we can't measure, but it's something we hypothesize, and we're going to try to make sure with a statistical model that those are valid, and these items that we're measuring correspond to those. So again, one factor model, there is just one thing. Is my training good? Is my training bad? And what degree of in between is there? Uh, second one is there is some kind of training efficacy, there is some kind of training relevance, and I'm going to split, try to split them apart. And the way that we're actually going to conduct this analysis is with something that we call structural equation modeling. Um, so what this allows us to do is kind of flexibly fit some of these models that refer to uh, latent constructs. It allows very flexible building of models. Um, so that you can compare some of these different things. Um, and I'm not going to go too much into the differences, but some of the things you'll see here, we can model uh, covariances across these latent uh, constructs that we're trying to measure. You're going to model some kind of uh, covariance between them. You're going to model all of the kind of regression slopes. You can th think of it in some sense here from our constructs to our actual measured variables as well as we're going to have some uh, residual errors in here since we know we're not actually measuring these, uh, these items with 100% accuracy across this big range of people. 
Um, so what we're really trying to do with this is say, we're going to put this model on top of the data and say, how well does the data correspond to this structural model uh, in this big orange part with these two factors, as well as the measurement model for these um, things that we're actually getting data on. And there's a lot of different ways to get model fit for these. Essentially, what we're doing here is uh, we're trying to say, I'm going to compare to some kind of uh, baseline model that almost models none of these variance covariance relationships that we know actually exist in the world. And I'm going to compare it to the um, kind of best model, one of these saturated models that says all of these things are going to exist. Um, so we can use these. I'm just going to talk about them as uh, CFI, TLI. These, we have kind of standards out in the literature. We want these to be above 0.9. Uh, the degree of misspecification, so how far is our uh, fit model to the uh, actual data that we observe. Uh, root mean square of the error is what we're going to use for that. And then um, some of these other measures that you see in other models, such as AIC and BIC. So feel free to follow up with me after this or ask questions during the Q&A, because um, I'm not going to talk too much about all of this, but I will show some of those and compare against these uh, standards that we have. Uh, so the first thing that we wanted to do, we needed to get uh, some sample data. So we um, did go in and try to get a bunch of these surveys administered across a broad range of systems. Uh, we ended up getting them across each of the services. Uh, Shane Hall from ATEC helped us out a lot. So we do have an oversampling of Army systems. Um, but we did get a very broad range of uh, users from this big range of systems, ended up in 812 responses across 24 systems. This was everything from uh, developmental test events, soldier touch points, uh, initial op operational tests, as well as uh, follow-on tests. Um, and we can slice this up a bunch of different ways. Some people make arguments that, oh, People weren't pay t paying attention if they're getting opposite responses for uh, forward or regularly worded versus reverse worded scales. Maybe we want to throw those people out because they're not paying attention. Uh, we could try it that way as well as the uh, typical way of keeping everyone in here. Um, it all works out the same. The fits look good. Um, so there's not too much to worry about. But uh, at least from my perspective and the way I was taught, as much as possible, we want to keep all of the data in our analysis as much as possible. That data means something, uh, and if you are going to try to filter people out, you need to have a really good justification for it instead of kind of speculating into some of these things that might have happened where we don't have too much evidence. Um, yes. So uh, the first thing we do is fit these initial models. Um, so on the left side here, you have our different metrics um, that are trying to capture different aspects of model fits. Over here, we have the goal that we're trying to um, get higher than or lower than, depending on what the metric is. And we have our one-factor unifactor model and our two-factor efficacy and relevance model. And what we see down here is I kind of coded all of these in red to essentially say this model really did not look good at the initial pass. So all of these things that we wanted to see, it was not looking good. Um, but kind of like what I was saying before, this is an iterative process. We don't, the hypothetical model we might want to have and want to fit well needs to be refined over time. Um, so what we're going to do is look into some, some diagnostics and try to see if we can make this better. Uh, so the first things that we looked at here, we get uh, standardized loadings onto each of our subscales. So the efficacy subscale is on the top. The relevant subscale is on the bottom. Um, and this is essentially saying for each of these items that we administered on the left side, it's the question number. Um, so for each of these items, how well did they actually load onto this uh, construct that we proposed that they would load onto? And for the most part, we see a lot of things above this kind of threshold that we're looking for with the kind of orangish dotted line. Uh, but we also see a bunch of items that are just 
loading to very low degrees. So it's saying they don't fit as well um, onto these as much as we might like them to. And from there, we went in and we said, um, what's going on? So the worst items were all of those reverse scored items. Um, we've seen this before, um, and it's happening again as we're looking at kind of the broad range of systems. People respond differently, at least on this scale, to the reverse coded items. So essentially, one way to read into that is saying people are thinking of responses to the reverse scored items in a different way than to the regularly uh, worded items. So since we are getting that difference in response variability, we want people to have consistent responses, and this is kind of uh, breaking that down. We want to do a first step of removing those items and trying to see what things look like. Uh, and the first thing that kind of jumps out at this is we see things are looking a lot better. Uh, these items are hanging together much more, and they're all getting closer to this actual cutoff um, of 0.7 that we put here. Um, it does vary a little bit depending on the scales that you're looking at. Um, but then the next step we can do is to try to um, cut out some of these less consistent items that are falling below the threshold we might want to use to keep in, especially given the fact that uh, in practice, it's usually, it's usually really useful if we can quickly administer some of these scales. Uh, survey fatigue, at least through a lot of these test events, is a real thing, and people do not give you quality data if they're tired. Uh, so we cut them down and essentially went back and tried to refit this one-factor and two-factor model again, trying to figure out now that we have understood more of how people are actually responding to this data, uh, how does the model fit look after we clean up some of this, uh, these things that were influencing inconsistent responses? Uh, and the first thing we see here, uh, we see a much better numbers across the board for both of these models. Uh, the model fit compared to the actual observed numbers are still a little bit off compared to where we might want them to be for the uh, one-factor model. Uh, but for this two-factor model, where we're splitting apart efficacy and relevance, we're seeing a much better fit along here. Uh, another thing that we can do is compare these two models using a chi-squared test. And what we can see here as well is the two-factor model is doing a better job with statistical reliability. Uh, the next thing we could do is something you see in a lot of different scales. So if you have subscales, you might also want to know, can we roll those numbers up and figure out an across-the-board kind of uh, metric of training? It doesn't mean that these uh, training efficacy and training relevant constructs are not differentiable. Um, but it's saying, are they so dissimilar that we can't even kind of roll them up together is the thing that we want to look at. Uh, so again, we fit this other model, but put this training effectiveness. I kind of apologize for the wording on here. It's a little bit easy to uh, mix up with efficacy. Um, but just generally, uh, do they kind of feed up to a higher level construct? Does the model still fit when we add this into here? Um, and essentially, the takeaway answer is yes. Um, and this is kind of what we have been uh, rolling out over time. It's going to be on the Test Science website very soon. Uh, we have some recommendations of scales, at least things that we see a lot during operational tests. Um, so we have a nice fit on here. It's much shortened. It's no longer 15 items. It's now just a quick six-item scale. Uh, and we can always talk about some of the details in here. Um, and just in terms of administration schedules, you guys can always reach out to us in terms of uh, if you're not sure when to administer things or how to do that, how to fit this into your text matrix, how many people do you actually have coming in from these different operator kind of groups. And if you want to run a power analysis, how, much, how many people do you need to get kind of reliable results that you could trust? Um, and I'm just going to very briefly uh, talk about some of this stuff. Um, what we really want to know in terms of training is uh, how it will evolve over time. So systems, especially these new systems, are going to continue receiving upgrades. Uh, things that we see earlier on during DT 
uh, are going to be different from things that are happening later on. Uh, but we might want to know whether training was more or less relevant to different types of uh, maybe certain missions are much more represented in training and therefore the translation of training to kind of fielded performance is much more kind of uh, consistent, whereas for other missions it might not uh, kind of work as well. Um, but we really want to know across all these relevant missions, across all of the capabilities, across the wide range of people that might be working on this with various types of backgrounds or experience with similar systems. Um, sometimes adding some data collection points, depending on what you're doing, can really help out put some quantitative numbers on so that when you do do additional uh, conversations with them and ask about what's going on when you find issues, when you find things that you want to provide clear mitigations for, you can make more constructive recommendations to your programs. Uh, so really, uh, feel free to contact us if you don't have this uh, six item set of uh, survey items yet. Uh, definitely report both of these subscales. You can also report the roll-up if you're interested. But, I mean, in many times, you will see these numbers going together uh, where your relevance and efficacy are showing either high or low performance. We know that a lot of times uh, trainings are either good or bad in a lot of ways, but sometimes you might have a training that really helped them on some aspects of system performance, but maybe not others. Um, and with that, I'll kind of plug our testscience.org website. We have lots of information on there. Uh, we have emails to contact us and reach out. Um, and I will kind of briefly say what we are kind of trying to do in the future. What we didn't get a chance to do here, but what we do want to do in the future is look into more of these types of reliability and validity. You don't always get to get all of these at once. Um, so if we do want to actually estimate kind of this test retest reliability, if I'm asking two people with similar experience um, to do it at two time points where they haven't necessarily learned something, uh, it's the type of reliability that we want, as well as these correlations with outcomes, we can we don't want to look at just suitability assessments. Uh, you get a lot of stuff mixed into there that isn't necessarily about training. So trying to uh, make this correspond to some more objective uh, aspects of trainings. Um, just kind of alluding to some of that stuff we'll continually be working on. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And let me know if you have any questions. Yes. Have you thought about recording the time between training and the actual when they uh, use the system for the first time and when they take the survey? Or even how many, like, is it the first time they've used the system? Is it the tenth time they've used the system? Have you thought about incorporating that into the surveys? Yeah, so we have some of that information, but across the kind of 800 responses and different test events, we don't have consistent numbers. I think the thing that we would really need to do to, for that, it would definitely be an interesting thing to look at where um, I presume that the, the connection between training and actual performance is going to be pretty tightly and closely related, kind of closer to there, but as they're using it more, um, depending on how the system's working, it might kind of, training might be more or less representative of it. Um, yeah, not something we've done though. I think we got. Hi, uh, Neil Fitzpatrick with Ida. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. You you mentioned about experience of a soldier, or airman, whoever taking the test, and how that could fit within the data set. So, if you're going to you use a rolled up OAT score, are there certain assumptions about that rolled up score in the data? And what came to mind was experience level in soldiers or mm -hmm. an airman, right? They might be introduced to a system they've never even been in an operational environment yet. They get trained on it. They think mm -hmm. it's the greatest thing they ever saw. Or you might get a, another person who's, this is their third system. They've been in the field for 15 years, and they'll know it's going to help them in efficacy or relevancy. So how do you deal with that data, you know, based on experience levels? Yeah, 
Very, very good question, very practical question. Um, and one of the things that we see in a lot of um, kind of assessments that we do for test events is we ask them, uh, how long since you started in the service? How long since you have been on this kind of uh, type of equipment, depending on what it is? And kind of like you're saying, you might have a completely new type of technology that's really accessible to people that are used to touchscreen interfaces and all kinds of this new stuff, uh, whereas different systems might be much easier to operate if you're coming from a background where knowing what it's doing in, in the previous iteration is much more representative of what it's doing now. So step one is measuring those pieces of information. Step two is kind of looking at those interactions between the variables of how much they've been using the prior systems and then how these uh, these OAT scores are related to actual outcomes. So uh, measures of effectiveness on the system for that specific user. So we need metadata that says, how can I connect this operator's OAT scores and level of experience with the system to a specific outcome? And we also need enough people. This is something that we miss in a lot of places. Sometimes we don't get that many operators to actually work with this system in these operational test events. If we don't get that, a lot of times we don't have the ability to detect with reliability whether something is actually going on. So since we're connecting multiple of these variables, it becomes harder to detect unless we have more people in there. So connecting metadata as well as more people, I think, are the big things. I have a question from you. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Jason Sheldon. Does the fact that the survey will change going forward have any effect on the results you've already gathered? So the question, the question going forward is not necessarily how much it will change. I think the uh, bigger question that we do want to answer is with a new independent set of data, independent set of uh, survey responses on a new set of systems, are those responses going to match this same kind of um, structure to a close enough degree that we can be confident that the results that we got from here are uh, able to generalize enough to the other set of systems that we haven't yet seen that we want uh, to use this, this, this survey for. So I would say, no, it's not a worry, but yes, it is something that we want to work on because we do want to know, is there something wonky or weird about these people that we got? Um, can we also do this again with an independent sample? I think I saw, yeah. Yes. Um, did you try anything other than the structural equation model to analyze the data? Yes. I'm thinking specifically mm -hmm. using RIDIS. Sorry? I'm thinking specifically using RIDIS, which are set up to look for the differences between two of the latent variables. I'm not exactly familiar with what you're talking about, the Riddits. R-I-D-I-T. Mm-hmm. Okay. That may help. Yeah. I would have to look it up. I wouldn't be surprised if it performed something very similar, probably just from a different approach. Um, but yeah, I could definitely look into that. So did you try something besides structural equation models? So we also did things that I didn't really get into here, uh, things beforehand. So there are other approaches that are more kind of exploratory, this is more of a confirmatory analysis to say, I have a structure, or I guess here I have two sets of structures I want to impose on this data, and I want to see how well that works. Another thing that we did do is more of a kind of exploratory factor analysis to make sure, are these items cross-loading onto different factors? Um, so that's something that we had done before, and es essentially it helped us uh, kick out any items that, um, we thought were related to relevance, but also had a high loading on the efficacy subscale or something like that. So it's kind of a, a way to, at an earlier stage, um, refine to items that are more representative that we know are going to be problematic down the line. Yeah, didn't really go into that here, but yes. All right.